Okay, five, four, three, two, one, and really happy to be with Dr. Malcolm Hendrick. He is a maverick genius doctor, in my opinion, uh, who has written a number of books, actually has three published books, another one in the pipeline, um, along with peer-reviewed articles. And uh, Dr. Hendrick, uh, welcome and thank you for making time for us. I know you're writing your next book right now, and uh, um, how are things going for you today? Yeah, not too bad. My, my future bestseller, <laughs> which uh, uh, will sell millions of copies worldwide. No, it's fine. Um, um, I'm actually on holiday. I'm skiing in France currently. Uh, at least I am in my mind. I wasn't able to go. So uh, instead of which, I'm stuck in my office uh, writing, writing and writing and going mad. So. I hear you. I hear you. I, that's, that's, well, well, that's good that uh, maybe you know, next year, hopefully, you'll be able to Get, we'll all be able to travel more often, maybe even later this year. And um, I wanted to, you know, looking over your books, there's so many interesting things, and we want to keep this interview fairly short. We'll probably, but uh, the Doctoring Data book is something I think that many people would um, have, would find interesting. And would, could you just give us a little introduction to that? Yeah, well, um, I suppose one of the things, because I spend a lot of time looking at medical data and reading papers and um, coming to conclusions about how, how good or bad it is. But I was aware that a lot of people, you hear things, for instance, five cups of coffee a day kills you. And then the next day you get five cups of coffee a day is wonderful for you. And the day after that, five cups of coffee a day is bad for you again. And you hear all these things and people get headlines. And, and most people, I think, are, to an extent, a lot of people are saying, well, I've just given up listening to this because they just contradict themselves yes. all the time. How can they contradict themselves? How can two groups of scientists come out with what appear to be the exact opposite conclusions? And when we hear things about my particular interest is in statins, and they say, well, statins can reduce the risk of heart disease by 40%, or reduce the risk of this by 50%. And, and, you, and I'm thinking, well, I know what these figures mean, and they're being presented in such a way that they're, they're clearly designed to create some sort of emotion or, or action in, in people and I'm thinking well I, I know how this happens you know it's one thing I have learned is how this happens so I thought well I, I try and explain to people you know how it is you can get these weird statistics how you can get contradictory findings what do these things mean and what are the pressures that are going on behind it and I think as we, we discussed beforehand you know um, there's an awful lot of pressures on scientists to produce exciting results to sound as if what they're doing is really significant and there are also enormous commercial pressures. I mean, a major pharmaceutical product can make 15 billion, can sell $15 billion a year. That's profit, by the way. So when something can make $15 billion profit, there is a huge pressure, huge pressures to make things look positive, to make things look as beneficial as possible and to silence all naysayers. So you do become aware that the research is is not always what you think it is. And, and it, you're trying to get in behind that and say to people, you know, don't, don't, don't just believe this at face value. You know, one of the examples that I used early on was somebody saying, there's a, there's, there's a guy who lectures, who presents people with saying, you know, here's, here's two, here's two um, different uh, interventions. One of, one of which um, lowers the risk of, of prostate cancer by 20%. I can't remember the exact figure because I'm making this up off the top of my head. And the other one says that if you do 50,000 tests, then 10 less men will die of prostate cancer. Which of these tests are you going to go for? And everyone says, well, of course, I'm going to go for the first one. They say, well, these are the same tests. These are actually the same results. These are the same figures. And yet one of them sounds fantastic, and the other one sounds completely useless. And it's that sort of thing that, that happens when, when, when you find yourself looking at the data. So I did think, well, I, I, knowing this, maybe people would find it interesting. And I, and I called it, uh, it was actually my son who claims credit for calling it Doctoring Data. Because I said, I was going to write this book and it's going to be about how data is manipulated and blah, blah, blah. And he said, call it Doctoring Data. To which I went, yeah, that's a pretty good title. That's <laughs> great. Brilliant. It's catchy with alliteration. Well, yeah. Well, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I'd like to claim credit, but but I can't. So, it, so it's really just to help people understand these things. So, when when you get to say things, well, I, I know I know we said we we 
you know, talk about COVID next, but when, when you get the figures about COVID and testing and whatever, it, I think people would be interested in knowing, well, how did they get to these figures? What do these things mean? And, and most people have no idea. They don't even know where to start. And, and, and in fact, I've given lectures and medical students have come up and said, well, how do you read a paper? What, how do you start? What do you do with it? I was like, um, I'm not actually entirely sure how I do it. But one of the things that I do do, and I think it's interesting for people, is to say, don't look for what the paper says. Look for what the paper doesn't say. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, and one example I use is, is that um, one of the statins used for, for lowering cholesterol and preventing heart disease had a, had a, had a headline that it, it, it uh, reduces the risk of heart attack by 36%. And that was an advert that was for a drug called Libertor in the States. It's not Libertor. called that. Yeah, very, very well, big, big seller. And it's called Atorvastat. I think it's still called Libertor in Europe as well. Anyway, this is the biggest selling drug ever, ever. So I, I started looking at where that figure had come from. And you start cutting it down and cutting it down. You say 36% sounds really impressive. And that, it sounds like something you would absolutely want to do. So then the first thing you look for is, well, heart attacks, actually they're not always fatal some of them don't kill you in fact the majority of heart attacks in fact you can have heart attacks you didn't even know you had and they can only be picked up later and someone does an ecg and says you've had a heart attack in the past and you go, no i haven't you go, well actually you have and in fact about 40 percent 50 in women about 50 percent of heart attacks don't cause any symptoms at all they're unaware that it's even happened right? 50 percent with women and yeah. And with men, less men. men seem to get more symptoms. It's probably because we're wusses, you know, like man flu, you get man heart attacks. That's just a man heart attack, it's not a proper, proper heart attack that a woman would suffer. So, um, so was, to, to that extent, a lot more people thought women, women didn't have as many heart attacks as they actually do. So, so there's all sorts of figures like this. So heart attacks, and in fact, if you're doing a, a procedure where you put in a stent, I don't you know what a stent is, yes. where you get a blockage in the artery, and you go in and you put a thing up through the groin and you get up to the heart and you put in a little metal stent and you open it up and it keeps the artery open, which is, is quite a remarkable and clever thing to do. All right. um, but actually when you do that, that very often triggers a rise in what we call cardiac enzymes, troponin it's called, which is high enough that it's diagnosed as a heart attack. Now nobody even knew there was a heart attack. If you hadn't measured the enzymes, you wouldn't know there was a heart attack. So, so you've got to remember is when someone says it reduces the risk of heart attack by 36%, you say, well, that's all great and fantastic. But what does it mean with regard to dying of heart attacks? You know, fatal heart attacks. So when you say, well, where is that? You find, I can't find that in this paper. Ah. Right? What does it mean with regard to overall death? Because another thing is, of course, as I've said to people, if I decided I wanted to stop you dying of a heart attack, it could push you off a cliff and you could fall to the ground and die of multiple injuries at the, at the bottom. Right? You haven't died of a heart attack and you will never now die of a heart attack. So I've reduced your risk of dying of a heart attack to 0%. If I pushed a thousand people off a cliff, none of them would then die of a heart attack. Absolutely. <laughs> I have now discovered how to prevent anyone from dying from heart attacks. Just push them off a cliff. Now you might think that's not really worth it, is it? But you can obviously die of other things. So if you're doing one thing that stops something happening and then they just more of them die of another thing, it's not worth it either. So that's what they call overall mortality. So another thing to look for is what was the difference in overall mortality? That is the risk of dying from anything. And that's another issue that quite often doesn't appear. When it doesn't appear, it means it didn't change. So this is one thing I say to the medical students. If you can't find anything about overall mortality in, in a in you know a study on something you'd think would look at that it means they didn't find any difference so they haven't mentioned it if you can't find any change in what they call cardiovascular mortality it means it didn't change if it had changed it would be right there it would be in the headline. headline all right right so when you don't see that headline you know it didn't happen so i said that's the first thing i do is i look for things that aren't mentioned like really important things you think were mentioned so when you looked at this paper from the 36% Lipitor reduction in heart attacks, and you say, so what was the difference in fatal heart attacks? There was no difference in fatal heart attacks. Then you say, what was the difference in overall mortality? There was no difference in overall mortality. So effectively, nobody was prevented from dying. There were less heart attacks. Did other things happen instead? Well, let, let's not go down that route. 
but the latest cholesterol lowering drugs that some people may or may not have heard of injectables are hugely expensive they lower your cholesterol by 16 bazillion percentage points or whatever it is um now when they came out then they had this fantastic thing saying there was a again it was something like a 40 percent or 56 percent reduction in cardiovascular events all right hang on well, what is a cardiovascular event all right and then you say, well, a lot of it was to do with reduction in the number of stents put in. There was a reduction in, in, in hospital admission with angina, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, then you say, this was fantastic. It was presented as the most wonderful thing that had ever happened in the history of happening, right? The da 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 Fourier trial on, what's it called? Anyway, I can never remember what PCSK stands for either, but never mind. And then said, well, what was the difference in overall mortality? It's presented as, I can't remember the exact figure, it was like 40 to 50% reduction in cardiovascular events. Nothing about overall mortality. So when I went and looked and went back, and, and you've got to go into some very, very, very deep research when you do this, because it is not there. What I discovered was there were slightly more people who died in total taking the drug. So there was, there was an increase in overall more, There was an overall increase in deaths on taking this drug. More people died. And there was an overall increase in the total number of cardiovascular deaths. Wow. They were not statistically significant. They were like five out of 400 people or, or figures of that ilk. But then you say, well, this drug was designed to lower cholesterol, stop you dying of heart disease, and therefore your overall mortality should also fall because cardiovascular disease kills 40% of people. So you'd expect to see some impact going on there. Instead of which, we saw the cardiovascular events drop hugely. Cardiovascular event deaths went up a bit, and overall deaths went up a bit. So, and yet, this drug is now being prescribed to patients around the world to lower cholesterol levels and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Even so though, looking, <laughs> sorry, yeah. even though it doesn't, even though it increases mortality, uh, yeah, you're slightly more likely to die. <laughs> So great stuff. So, so this, you know, I know this stuff because I spent far too much of my life because cardiovascular disease is my big thing. So I, I read these papers and when something, like, in fact, when these drugs first appeared on the horizon, I thought, well, this will be interesting because I've argued for many years that cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease, right? Now statins do reduce cholesterol and they do reduce the risk of heart disease, but only by a very small amount. Now, I'd long argued that was through an, a completely of a different effect that statins have. So a different yeah. mechanism, if you will. A different mechanism. It's what they call pleiotropism. It's, it's an unexpected mechanism. A bit like with aspirin was used to lower temperature and inflammation, and then they found that it reduced the risk of heart disease. It's, it's another effect it has that just is, wasn't, uh, wasn't expected, wasn't designed for, but there you go, all right? Sure. Or, or, or looking more and more and more and more, um, um, a drug with a worse reputation, thalidomide was designed to, to reduce morning sickness. Uh, then it stopped blood vessels growing, so people's arms and legs got very short. And now they discovered that through the effect of blocking blood vessel growth, it's used as an anti-cancer drug. So it is still used as a drug today. It's not called thalidomide anymore for obvious reasons. So, you know, drugs can do all sorts of different things that you would not expect. So statins, last time I looked at 42 different effects on the body outside of lowering the cholesterol level. Uh, one of which is that they raise a thing called nitric oxide, which some people may have heard of. And nitric oxide is anticoagulant, stops blood clots forming, um, and therefore almost certainly uh, is having a benefit in that way. And that's, that's, you know, that's my argument, which I was quite comfortable with. It does other things. It, could cause benefits in cardiovascular disease as well. So I thought, well, here come the PCSK9 inhibitors and they're whacking the cholesterol down. So if they have real benefits on cardiovascular disease, then I'm, I, I will be wrong. But so, so in a way, um, and sadly and uh, selfishly, I was quite pleased to see that. <laughs> right. <laughs> sort of difference in, in, in preventing heart disease deaths at least. So, um, but, I think the, these things are, so with doctoring data, I've looked at these sort of things, that the benefits of cancer screening, which are presented is absolutely fantastical. But when you go into it, you think, really? And, and, and all sorts of other interventions and things like 
you know, coffee drinking, where does that come from? Is there a benefit? Is there not a benefit? So it's, uh, it's really just an attempt to help people to, to make some sense for themselves. So when they hear a, a headline, uh, the first thing they should say is, okay, so what was it? What does that really mean? <laughs> right. What was saying here? And, uh, and one, of, one of the, this was one key thing, perhaps the key other thing is, is the difference between, which I sort of go on a bit about, is the difference between absolute and relative risk. And, 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 and I know this is important because I've asked maybe 50 doctors to explain to me what the difference between absolute risk and relative risk is, and none of them have been able to do so. And this is absolutely fundamental for the way that information is presented. So when I say to people, um, I can double your chances of winning the lottery. You know, that's a, that's a fantastic 100% improvement. No. Um, uh, well, buy two tickets. But um, <laughs> I, I can improve, uh, um, uh, but that improves it from one in 18 million to one in 9 million. So the actual absolute improvement is one in 9 million. The relative improvement is, is 50% or 100% or whichever way you want to think of it. So when you say to people, I can reduce your risk by 50%, you say 50% of what? 50% of something that's quite likely to happen is quite important. 50% of something that is almost never going to happen is really unimportant. So are you, I, whether this is the correct example or not, so you get two, in, in clinical trials, they get two groups, they get the, the placebo group and the treatment group. So say you had a placebo group and a treatment group of 100 people. And you, and you give the treatment group an, a blood pressure lowering tablet just for the sake of our argument and the placebo group got nothing at the end of five years or ten years or however long the trial went on for one person died in the treatment group put it that way around and two people died in the in the non-treatment placebo group all right so so the absolute difference is 99 percent versus 98 percent which is one percent the relative difference is two versus one which is 50 percent right now say you then did the trial for a thousand people and at the end of the trial two people died in the placebo group and one person died in the treatment group the, the, the absolute difference is 998 versus 999 or 0.1 percent the relative difference remains two versus one 50 percent so if you did it for ten thousand people a million people right? yeah you said the same thing the same effect the relative difference remains the same the absolute difference can be here so unless you know what the absolute risk was to start with, the relative difference makes no sense. It doesn't actually tell you anything at all that you would like to know. So what does that mean? Is it going to happen to me or is it not going to happen to me? Well, your risk was one in 500 million before, and now it's one in 250 million. The chances are not, it was never going to happen to you, and it's still not going to happen to you. Um, you know, if your risk at the start thing was a 50%, you've got a 50% chance of dying of this, and I'm going to reduce it, all right? I'm going to reduce it to by 50%. You know, a reduction of 50% to 50% is 25%. And that's and that, huge. That's, that's a huge. A reduction of 50% of 250 million and one in 250 million is irrelevant. And so a lot of clinical trials will come out and say there's a 10% reduction in the risk of dying of colon cancer if you eat fiber or whatever. All right. And you go, well, what does that mean? How many people were likely to die of it? And what's your time period as well? Because if they don't tell you time period, you don't know anything. Because if that was a if that was, if a week, that would be quite important. If it was over a period of 30 years, that's a huge amount of time. So the time is also important. They never tell you the time period. 10% right. over what? My entire life? Between now and tomorrow? So they don't tell you the time period. They don't tell you the absolute risk. They don't provide you with any of the background information that you need. <clears throat> so it is essentially meaningless. So it's, and the other thing that they do is, 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 is very often in these studies, they come up with what they call an observational study. So an observational study means I observe 100,000 people doing one thing, and then I say, well, you know, and what did they die of? And what happened to the ones that died? What did they do more of or less of than the right. ones who didn't die? All right. So I, I don't actually actively do anything. I just look at people. All right. So what they did with uh, with smoking was an observational study. In fact, was that they looked at doctors who smoked and doctors who didn't smoke in the UK and then said, well, how many of them are dying of lung cancer? And what they found was actually, if you smoked, you were 17 times more likely to die of lung cancer during the study period, right? So that was a huge difference. Uh, many people will tell you, you can't claim anything for sure from an observational study. 
because people may be doing all sorts of other things that are different. So one of the problems you have with with these, you know, red meat is bad for you, is that people who eat red meat also tend to be people who smoke more, who drink more, who take less exercise, etc. All right, these are we call conjoined factors. Right. right. So. Yeah. So, so if you're looking at people who are vegetarian, for example, the other people, people who are vegetarian are often doing it for health reasons. So they'll often, they'll do quite a lot of exercise. They won't smoke. They don't do this. They don't do that. Right. So, so which, which, you know, you can say it, it may have been that red meat was bad, or it may have been all the other things that you do. So the other thing that people do is when they do these studies and come up with these answers, like coffee drinkers, people who drink a lot of coffee in some countries probably have unhealthy behaviors. So people in, in, in say, I, I don't know this. I'm just making this up. But people in America who drink lots of coffee may, may be that they are also people who smoke because they go for a coffee and that they smoke more and they have a coffee and a smoke at the same time. But people in France who smoke drink coffee, that's just generally what you do. You have a coffee at 11 o'clock and whatever with your friends and it's a social thing. So, so the coffee drinking is associated with completely different other factors in America than France. So right. when you say, oh, it seems to be harming you in America, you go, yeah, that's not the coffee, you idiots, it's the other things. And it seems to be beneficial in France. That's because it's social and people who are sociable and more likely to survive for other reasons. So you get all this gump and then you say, well, that didn't mean anything. So the general rule is unless the difference is greater than twofold in an observational study, it's meaningless because you cannot account for all the other factors. So that's why you tend to get all these things about if you eat sausages, you're more likely to get bowel cancer and blah, blah, blah. It's just meaningless noise. This right. is just meaningless noise. And once you understand how the meaning is noise is generated, of course, that's how you get money. You're, you, you, you as a unit say, we've done this study and we found it, blah, isn't it exciting? And then, and then the money comes to you and you do more, more meaningless blah and make more headlines and then you get more meaningless blah and then you've got a huge unit. And all you, all you do from that point on is, is do meaningless blah studies that generate headlines around the world. Right, which brings more funding into your program and everybody's, the gravy train goes on. And you know, everybody in the world who believes in blah is now, is now a world leader. You know, they go to conferences talking about blah. And right. everybody says, right. that's just rubbish. You know, well, we're not inviting you to our conference. You're just saying it's rubbish. You know? So it, it becomes also self-perpetuating a lot of this stuff. And, 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 and that's another thing that happens is, that it gets into camps. The blah camp of rubbish becomes this enormously powerful thing. And, and they produce articles and journals and they get professorships and money floods into their university and everyone's really happy. So it's, there's those other aspects that occur at the same time. You know? Right, right. Well, you know, there's also another big commercial interest in the, what I call the, and what others call the diet wars, you know, with the, you have the vegan, the paleo camp, and you have the, the keto camp, camp and the carnivore camp and of course if if i'm a uh, if i'm running a multinational food corporation um, what i want is to make more profit right i want i want my share i want my stocks to go up i want my shareholders to be happy and we start off with the, what's lower what is it called what is what lowers my cost well i'd rather sell non-meat based products that i can create processed foods with not and then and then put it on the vegan the vegan uh, headline, um, because the, 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 the packaging is actually the advertisement right in the grocery store, and then you get to, you spend more money actually advertising your products than you do actually producing the food. That's how, that's sort of how it works in many cases. But, uh, so that's part of, that explains part of the, and not to say that, that uh, all the, that I'm not, I'm not taking a, uh, you know, one side in the whole war of the, because I think you can do, you can do well with lots of different, eating lots of different things. I mean, we're omnivores by, by uh, his, historic fashion, aren't we? <laughs> oh yeah, well, I, I liked it all this years ago um, because I was interested in heart disease and I was interested in the hypo the central hypothesis, which still remains is you eat saturated fat, which is basically animal fats. So it's, however you exactly define that and that raises your cholesterol and then you die of heart disease. So I thought, well, you know, where's the evidence that saturated fat is bad for you? Um, so I looked into this 30, 40 years ago, you know, and to show you how old I am. Uh, I came to the conclusion that saturated fat had absolutely no impact on heart disease or in fact on anything that I could much measure. It might, might be beneficial rather than eating, well, it's definitely beneficial rather than eating trans fats, which were created so you didn't eat 
saturated fats like margarine you'll notice margarine has disappeared it no longer exists you can you can have low fat fat low fat spreads right you can't have margarine anymore because margarine was artificially created but anyway so i thought well you know there's, there's nothing here i'm not interested any longer but then more recently a lot of people have i think since that time the low fat um agenda has been promoted harder and harder and the high carbohydrate foods have been promoted harder and harder and it seems absolutely no doubt that that has been one of the major factors behind the rise in obesity and diabetes in both well, the uk and the us are running head and head ahead of the world and becoming enormously fat and diabetic and and you say well these, these things are not coincidental if you understand anything about science which nobody does and or i find very few people understand it's clear why if you if you eat more carbohydrates in excess of what you need you will put on fat you will also more likely become diabetic this is just an inevitable physiological consequence of the way the body works and yet i have other people try, i i did a i went to a talk where i was against a professor of nutrition i was saying the great english breakfast is perfectly healthy eat it if you want and he was saying it's terribly unhealthy and saturated fats will kill you. And I started talking about uh, de novo lipogenesis in the liver, which is actually the creation of fat in the liver itself from carbohydrates, i.e. sugar. And, and he said, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> well, where, where, did he, where did he get that from? I, looked, I said, uh, well, uh, I read it in like, and I've, I've spoken to like professors of biochemistry and stuff, and, and it, of course it happens. But because he was so attached to one point of view, he never even he never even looked at the possibility that carbohydrates, well, carbohydrates are just sugars. All carbohydrates that you can digest are turned and converted into glucose, because your body doesn't like to use any other sugar, so it all ends up as glucose and or fat in the liver. And the way the fat's created is because the liver makes it from sugar, from glucose or fructose. Then you have fat, and then the fat is taken from the liver. And distributed around the body and and he he was a professor of um nutrition well he's definitely a professor of that area i'm trying to remember and he didn't even know this happened right but, right yeah he said where did you hear this I went, well i didn't hear it i went and i mean that's read right. about it it's a it's a basic not, biochemical not, thing yeah he not studied anything about physiology or human biology or anything like that you know, so well, he, well, well, if he had, he'd, he'd obviously missed the lecture. Or, or right, right. I'd fallen asleep at the back when it's that bit that says carbohydrates in excess <laughs> will be converted to fat in the liver. That sort of page one, paragraph one, you know, of how are fats dealt with or how is carbohydrate dealt with in the human body. So I'm thinking, well, if I'm up against this kind of level, this guy's a professor. I mean, how the hell did he get to be a professor? Question one, you know. Right. Yeah, what is a carbohydrate? Uh, don't know. Question two: What is a fat? Uh, don't know. It's like I mean, so it's just so anyway. The but but yes, the problem here, you circling back, is is that you you've got these camps now. You've got two. It's like warring tribes. It's it's it was just nonsensical. You know, if someone wants to be vegetarian or vegan because of ethical considerations, off you go, knock yourself out. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Unless you start coming around and daubing my door with, uh, with nasty symbols or whatever, it, from a from an e ecological or environmental point of view, there is an argument that, that that you know, eating meat and growing lots and lots of animals, to an extent, because you need you have to have animals, or or else your 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 infrastructure it doesn't it doesn't work. Your ecological structure falls apart. Anyway, that's a completely different argument. But from a health perspective, you know, shut up about it it's just not true you know and 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 i know it's not true but but you and then of course the commercial groups become involved because the low fat manufacturers you know what's what's cheap sugar what's expensive animal fat or fat so what do we want to fill our yogurts with sugar you know yeah and we're going to tell people this is this is healthy yeah well and not only that you you have the you have you've got the possible addictive and there's the, there is, of course, the argument, is it addictive or not? Well, we know that, it, that sugar goes to the pleasure center of the brain. We get the rise in dopamine, rise in serotonin. So whether that's addiction or not, it certainly is pleasurable. I mean, I could, anyone that has kids out there can vouch for the fact that 
kids don't ask for more steak. Uh, they don't ask for, you know, more chicken or more fish. They ask for more cookies and more ice cream and more sugary yogurt. And, uh, and well, they do. Well, I mean, there's a test, you've heard of the test, the marshmallow test. Which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, that's it. You, you put a marshmallow or some other delicious treat on the table in front of a young child and say, you can eat it now, or if you wait five minutes, we'll come back and give you another one, so you'll have two. And, and the children that can resist for more than five minutes are apparently going to become the CEOs of large companies and whatever. But I say, well, they, never do, they don't do this test with a broccoli stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, we have it in my, my kids. I have a four and a half year old son. And so every day after school here in Spain, they're in school from, from nine to, to almost five. It's amazing. But uh, we go to the park with, with uh, and I, we've got a number of doctors in the, in the, in his uh, that are parents in the class uh, of classmates rather so we're talking about nutrition and uh, they've had no nutrition um, that other than what they picked up on their own and uh, we were just speaking about this yesterday and they were saying the biggest difficulties when you go visit the grandparents because the grandparents give them all the things that they they've got they weaning they're weaning them off of sugar until Christmas and then yeah. after Christmas it's you, it takes them until it takes them three months to wean them off the sugar again. Yeah, well, I mean, the grandparents know how to bribe their grandchildren, that's for sure. You know, I, you know it is. Um, I don't know why this is fascinating. Actually, I was looking, you know, I look around this area and I just think, well, why, why are we adapted like this? Um, and um, and and in fact, one of the groups that I was looking at, this is slightly sideways. I hope I understand where I'm coming from. I was looking at, I was saying that you know. Um, um, what causes what causes diabetes is becoming obese all right that's the theory right and so the, the fatter you get the more likely you are to be diabetic and the reason why you therefore should eat avoid fats is because fats contain twice as many calories per gram okay so if you eat 100 grams of fat that's 900 calories of energy if you eat 100 grams of carbohydrate that's 400 or 500 calories of energy right? so that's another reason it's, it's presented I started looking and saying, well, is it true that if you become, becoming obese actually is the thing that makes you diabetic? So I said, well, I'm going to try and find a population in the world that is really, really, really thin. That's really, really, the thinnest population in the world. The thinnest population in the world is not actually a population, it's individuals who have a condition called congenital generalized lipodystrophy, CGL, otherwise known as Burdinelli CF. They have no fat cells no way of storing fat. So they are the thinnest people in the world. Can't get thinner than that. How many of them have got type two diabetes? Every single one of them has got very severe, intreatable type two diabetes. Wow, that's amazing. I know, and then people say, well, how can that be? I said, well, that can be my friend, because <laughs> I've just been writing about this, so I should know. Um, the other, the fattest population in the world is sumo wrestlers, and none of them have diabetes. But the uh, these people, all right, they have no fat cells. Okay, start point. They eat, and the other problem with that is because they've got no fat cells, they have no leptin. Leptin is a hormone produced by fat cells that says I'm fat. With no leptin, they're hungry all the time, so it's really hard for these people not to eat. Apparently, apparently, um, um, certain dogs like um, Labradors don't have any leptin either, which is why they'll get fat. So they've got no fat cells they eat carbohydrate they eat carbohydrates and then their liver is filled with carbohydrates at, or sugar 500 calories uh, their muscles are full of, of carbohydrates sort of glycogen 1000 calories they eat more carbohydrates where do the carbohydrates now go where does the sugar go well the liver tries to convert it into fat then it's got nowhere to go so what happens is it starts coming out of the liver as is another protein thing called fatty liver very very low density lipoprotein triglycerides. So the level of this goes through the roof, obviously. That puts enormous back pressure on the system of producing fat. The insulin level goes through the roof. The glucose can't be converted into fat because there's no conversion process. It's just been basically blocked. It starts to leak into the bloodstream. So these people inevitably develop type 2 diabetes, not because they're obese, it can't be because of that, because they're incredibly thin, because they haven't got anywhere else to store. In, in this case, there is nowhere for the glucose to go. It's 
is just is trapped in their systems. So I know you say, fine. Well, I then look for, I tried to find the case of somebody who didn't have this gen genetically. It was a woman who took an anti-cancer drug that wiped out all her fat cells. So she developed Burden Ellie Siep syndrome, immediately lost her weight, obviously, immediately became type two diabetic. So it's diabetes is not actually due to obesity per se. It's due to not being able to store excess energy. And if the excess energy comes in in the form of carbohydrates, which is converted to glucose, then there's nowhere for it to go. And then you become diabetic. So the actual diabetes thing is carbohydrate intake. If you eat fats, your fat cannot be converted back into sugar. That doesn't happen. And the fat is neither does the fat even go through the liver. The fat goes straight through your system, up through a specialized little tube called the thoracic duct into your bloodstream, where it travels around and loses, sheds all the fat that it's got. In, these are big, big lipoproteins. They shed all their fat and then shrink down and they're absorbed into the liver. So actually eating fat has no impact on the liver at all. And it can have no effect on, on effectively diabetes because fat cells, assuming you can continue to store and create fat cells, you will never become diabetic. So you get these people who are enormous. You've seen them, they weigh 80 stone or whatever that is in pounds in America. And they're not diabetic and people think, how can these people not be diabetic? They're enormously fat. So it's because, because they can store fat. They're, they're great fat storers. Yeah. It's the people who can't, who then run into problems storing fat. Right. Well, well there's, there, there certainly are cases of athletes. I mean, I'm no professional athlete, but I was, have always done a lot of sports, have done some triathlons, done a bit of everything with mastering nothing. <laughs> and and uh, was, uh, had my A1C done um, a number of years back, and boom, I was in the pre I was was coming right up on, was right in the middle of the, uh, the pre-diabetic range. And uh, that's what opened my mind to, wait a minute, I need to figure this out. And sure. I, you know, went back to the drawing board and started um, looking at um, some of the more progressive uh, folks in, in medicine and nutrition and realized I needed to reduce the carbohydrates a lot. And now I'm doing about less than 100 grams a day, most, yeah. uh, most days less than that, depending on my activity level. And that's what I coach my clients too, is we, you know, vary the carbohydrate based on what, what the outcome we're looking for. If someone is obese, we're going to go lower, but when they get more active, we perhaps bump it up. On um, the days yeah. that are less active, we lower it and it works quite well. And uh, Well, I mean, the other thing I looked at was, um, was we call it, is um, high intensity exercise, which... Um, the Tabatas, like Dr. Well, Tabata from Japan, are you familiar with his... No, nope. probably Tabata. seen the same thing. Yeah, yeah. If, if you exercise anaerobically, then you get half a calorie per each um, gram of glucose, mm -hmm. um, and some of it's returned. But basically, you can burn out your glucose stores very quickly with um, high intensity exercise. Which is why I believe the sumo wrestlers, when they're training, do not get type two diabetes because the, every day they're burning out their glucose stores rapidly, and of course they fill them up again because they're eating vast amounts of food, and they're trying to become fat, but they right. don't become diabetic because because basically they keep burning out their glucose stores twice a day every day, and that, that if you use short burst high intensity exercise, you can burn out your sugar stores. I was reading something which I've lost, which was that. You know, the people who do the super powerlifting, the, the guys that lift 500 kilograms or whatever it is, and you think, well, they, they're going to burst, you know. Some of these people can use effectively what they call a thousand calories in one go in about three seconds, you know, because they just blow all their, all their glyco glycogen glucose stores in one, one go, which is why they, they have to be very careful they don't overdo it, you know, they don't. They don't go up through the weights because you can't, because by the time, if you do that, by the time you reach the heaviest weight, you're, you're gone because your stores have gone. You know, you've got to replenish and it takes quite a while for that to happen. So they, they have to be very careful when they enter, you know, the, the weightlifters in the Olympics, they have to be very careful when they enter the competition because if they enter too low, they'll never get to the top weight. <laughs> right, right. Right, because they've, nice. they've bl blown out their, their energy stores and their muscles. Um, and, and in the liver and filling them up again takes a while.
you know. So um, so it's, it all anyway that 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 to an extent that's by the by. But the, the, the your argument, your discussion is it's it's carbohydrates are if you're if you're of low weight. I mean, if you had burned in LACF syndrome and you ate exactly what you needed every day, and you burned off all your energy, excess energy every day, you wouldn't have a metabolic problem and you wouldn't have diabetes. But it's very difficult to do that. Yes. So with normal people. And people have said, oh, well, you do these, you know, on dieting, they say, well, if you, if you diet and you reduce calorie intake to 1,500 calories with a low-fat diet or a high-fat diet or a high-carbohydrate, it, it doesn't make any difference. Because, well, of course it doesn't. Because if, you, if you're using less calories than your body needs, sure, you it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter in what form you take them. You're going to lose weight and approximately the same amount of weight in both cases and then this is the argument that actually low carb doesn't work because it's no more effective than weight loss yeah. i'm not worried about weight loss per se it's once you reach equilibrium it's once you start going above equilibrium what you should be doing right and if you're going above equilibrium and you are above equilibrium that's when you need to avoid the carbohydrates and switch to the to the fats to keep the system working properly but you can't get that idea into people's heads it's been like you're always doing the study at the wrong time i studied a 400 calorie low fat and a 400 calorie low carbohydrate diet and in both cases they lost the same amount of weight yeah and right and well, th well there's two there's two other two things there that, that we could talk about also and that is the uh, i think we don't have a weight problem i think we have a weight weight loss sustainability because oh, yeah. when you only look at it's, I think it's one of the most maddening things. I mean, there's so many maddening things in the world of, of, of health and, and, uh, and this is one of them. The idea that we only look at the gross weight. I mean, this is a medieval, this is not even medieval. This was, a, you know, thousands of years ago, the Romans were measuring weight in their markets, right? So when yeah. you measure weight, you're, you're presupposing that all the tissues and the fluids and the muscle and the bone, the skeletal system and the organs, you know, it's all the, you're not separating the, uh, the body composition at all. And we now can yeah. easily do that. And the simple way is just you measure, you measure the waistline. Maybe you yeah. measure the hips. Maybe you measure the, you know, you take a few simple measurements and, uh, and then you can tell if you're gaining some muscle or, you know, I find people quite often lose, you can lose 20 pounds and be skinny fat or you can lose 20 pounds and maintain your muscle and, and people will say, wow, what happened to you? You know, yeah. you look great. Do you know, have you experienced that with anyone? Well, I mean, in the, U well, in the UK, there's a huge problem with uh, diabetes uh, in the Asian population. The people from, that come from India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, et cetera. Right. Is that, and a lot of them do not have, body mass index is, is often not that high, but they've sure. got a high percentage of body fat, central obesity, and diabetes. Right. Such that they've actually defined, redefined, Di um, being obese in this group to a BMI of 25, which is what you call, you know, adjusting the uh, adjusting your hypothesis to meet the facts, if you like, and then claiming that you're in charge of what's going on. Right. But they, so, so there are people now. Why, why it is that what they call Asian Indians in the UK, and I think it's true in the States as well, find themselves very often skinny obese, if you like. Right. Uh -huh. um, is another question. Um, which is, is, is probably too complex to go into here because the central obesity thing is another thing to do with visceral fat and stress and blah blah blah. Because um, when a lot of people, when they eat, a, a number of people, when they eat carbohydrates, it stimulates their their flight and fight response. So that actually, they trigger stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, etc. Sympathetic system winds up, and when that happens, when you've got excess food intake is that it is directed to central fat stores not peripheral fat stores and that is why people become centrally obese in many cases rather than putting on weight all over which is also why if you give people steroids as a drug they become obese centrally and become thin peripherally so they lose muscle and body fat from around on their legs and then they put it all on centrally and going back, just circling back a little bit. So the the, the fighter, how how is the fighter the fight or flight syndrome was connect was stimulated by the overeating or the carbohydrates specifically? It was by by overconsumption of carbs. Yes, well, in part, it's probably because this is a theory. You eat 
when you eat, when the food first appears in your stomach um, as carbohydrates, it stimulates, uh, there are things called different cells in your body. They, some of them are in your pancreas, some of them are in your stomach called alpha cells. And alpha cells um, produce a hormone called glucagon. Glucagon, yes. Glucagon is the blood sugar raising hormone. And, um, and it's, it is one of the four stress hormones. And the others are cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and you know, five growth hormone, um, which then back triggers into your stress system. So some people are genetically determined, uh, which is one of the reasons why if you do stomach bypass operations, that the blood sugar level drops very quickly, very, very quickly, far quicker than any impact on, on body weight, because it's bypassing the glucagon production in the stomach. And the glucagon, some people think, this is a hypothesis that, that, that you know, it is an interesting question, sorry to, to, to keep looping around on other things, is if you give people an injection of 50 grams of sugar, the blood sugar goes up to X. If you give 50 grams of glucose orally, the blood sugar goes up to 2X. You think you can't get more sugar in your body than by sticking it straight into a vein. So how can this blood sugar level possibly go higher? When all your when your it has to go through your stomach first, it surely should be less high. And um, the, the the hypothesis guy called Unger, who's who was the, really the glucagon man, absolutely fascinating work that he did on it was that um, if you buy if you if you basically what happens is when you're about to eat sugar, your body says sugar is coming in, right? Glo carbohydrate sugar is coming in, the glucagon is released, it goes to your liver, it triggers the release of the sugar stores, the glycogen. So your liver is emptying out in in anticipation of the carbohydrates arriving. All right, that response, however, becomes counterproductive when you're full up with sugars and fats, and it, and and you then make things worse. Right. So he's, he's the guy that did work on rats, and what he found was if you removed all their beta cells, which are the things where insulin comes from, they all became diabetic. Their blood sugars went up. They produced tons of urine. They got very unwell, and they died. He then took out all their alpha cells from their pancreas and from their stomach. And what he found was their diabetes completely went away. They were no longer diabetic and they could cope with a sugar intake. So there'd be a sugar rise and a sugar fall. It wasn't quite as dramatic as you get with um, people who've got functioning um, pancreases. But actually, so, so what he proved is a couple of things. One is it's glucagon that makes your blood sugar go too high. You know, insulin is only one of the hormones playing around here and we've focused on that to the exclusion of all else. That you don't need insulin to deal with blood sugar intake, uh, glucose intake. Your body will deal with it. It won't deal with it quite as well, but you will not, you will not be diabetic and you will not be metabolically unwell. Without fact, insulin. Without insulin. No insulin. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's not a lack of insulin that makes you diabetic. It's a lack of insulin with glucagon riding unchecked in your system that causes you to be diabetic. And so we, we should really, and the glucagon is triggered as part of the sympathetic nervous system response, which is also triggered by glucose intake. So for some people, they deal with sugar far more if I like, um, frantically, but not, it, not healthily for their system, which is probably because for most of humanity's existence, it was quite hard to eat too many carbohydrates. So having this system, um, that said, right, we're going to get all this glucose and we're going to take it into the liver and we're going to sort it out there. So we need to clear out the glucose stores that we've currently got. Makes some sort of sense. It doesn't make any sense physiologically now, but it made sense when there wasn't that much in the way of carbohydrates. So you may have no problem with insulin. You may have no problem with that at all. It may be that you are a glucagoner and you're producing too much glucagon. Because you know the latest drug that's come out that showed weight loss, it's one of the gliptins. It's just because it's a glucagon inhibitor. It's not got anything to do with its insulin. But that's, uh -huh. that's, that's, that's fascinating stuff. It's fascinating stuff. Well, well anyway, uh, that, uh, we've kind of gone off beam, but once you, you know, so my, my obsession is, is going, why does that happen? <laughs> What's causing that? Why does that do that? Why is this like this? You know, so, and, 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 and when someone comes up with a bullshit answer, that's clearly not right. It doesn't make any sense because I think I don't ask what the body does. I ask why would the body do that? Why would this? Why would the body do this? Why does? Why does that happen? You know, rather than what happens or how it happens. Why does it happen? 
that's my kind of obsession. Why does this occur? Why why does that make this make this do that? And there must be a reason for it. And 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 that is kind of sorry, this is my my obsession, if you like, which is that until I can understand why something is happening, I'm not I don't believe it. No, stop. So you're so you're also you're a medical health detective. Well, I think that would be the thing. Well, it's just like heart disease. You know, why? If it's not LDL, if it's not cholesterol, which it's not, right? Just accept that. I know and, is, and, and by the way, I know we, that's moving, moving people a bit beyond their comfort zone, but it's got nothing to do with cholesterol and nothing to do with saturated fat and blah, blah. So what the hell else could it be? It is something, you know, something's doing this. So, so you, you start from that. You said your book, is that right? Well, uh, well, essentially I've said, okay, I've spent 40 years, 40 years of my life, Quite a large amount of it has been spent saying, well, what does cause people to die from cardiovascular disease? And um, boy, have I taken a few long <laughs> routes along the way. Uh, 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 it took me, um, I went back to, um, to actually a hypothesis first proposed 170 years ago by, by a researcher called Carl von Rokitansky. They had great names, these researchers in the past. And, uh, yeah. Uh, he worked with Rudolf Virchow in Vienna in the mid 19th century. Just fantastic. Um, anyway, but he he looked at people with. Well, I didn't actually look at people with heart disease because there was very few people died of heart disease in those days. He looked at people who died from other reasons and looked at their arteries and said, "What are these things in their arteries and what are they? You know, what are these thickenings and blockages and whatever? They did exist. Uh, they, they must have existed because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to see them." So people who tell me there was no such thing as heart disease until 19 whatever, uh, 12, I say, well, <laughs> well, what was he looking at then? Um, anyway, you can you can X-ray mummies and find that their arteries are full of calcium. So they obviously had serious atherosclerosis in, in, the, in the Egyptian period. So it's not a new disease. Anyway, he um, he looked at these blockages and said, what am I looking at? And he said, well, I, I seem to be looking at blood clots or the remnants of blood clots or blood clots that are being transformed into you know, old blood clots and transformation into different structures. And that was his, his hypothesis. We called it the incrustation hypothesis, that the thickenings and narrows in our, narrowings in arteries are blood clots, all right? So, so it's not a new idea, uh, but that is the basic idea. So if you come forward in time and pe people are quite willing to say, well, the last thing that happens in, a, in, in cardiovascular disease is you have a blood clot, which causes a stroke or a heart attack or whatever. And, and people are increasingly willing to accept that that you can get growth of um, of plaques due to a blood clot forming on top of an existing plaque, and then it repairs, and then that's that's actually the growth. That's what causes them to jump in size, and, and they may cause no symptoms because they haven't fully blocked the artery. So this just happens without you even being aware that anything has happened. So people are willing to accept that, that plaques, which are the thickenings and narrowings in your arteries can grow because of blood clots forming on top of them and then being sealed over again. And that the final event is a blood clot. And, and the only thing, the only sort of additional thing in a way that this is suggesting is, well, they actually, this is what causes them to start as well, is a blood clot forms on a wall, an artery wall, and then it is covered over by a new layer of artery lining. And that's the start. And it, and it happens at that point repeatedly because it becomes an area of turbulent flow and thinned wall and whatever. So people will say, yes, well, we accept that there are, that the plaques can make you, uh, a blood clot can make your plaque grow and it can kill you in the end. But blood clotting has got nothing to do with starting it in the first place. So, well, well it would seem sensible that the same process is the same process all the way through. Rather than we have one process that turns into another process. I mean, it could be the case, but it didn't seem very likely to me. So I then started trying to find out more about this, which this is a more recent phenomenon. I had other ideas before this, but um, and and then say, well, could this be the case? Can this be the case? Is there any evidence that this whole process can be blood clots from start to finish all the way through? And the, the simple answer is yes. And in fact. Somewhat ironically, when I was at medical school many years ago, one of the one of the lecturers gave a talk, a small group talk, where she said to me and the others, she said to me, LDL, low density lipoprotein, cholesterol, cannot get through the artery wall. This was in 1981, I think. 
and um, I didn't actually pay much attention to it at the time because I was too busy going down the pub and <laughs> enjoying myself. Um, but then I thought, well, that's strange because everyone else is telling me this, and this was a person who was researching it. And then I found out that she'd done an awful lot of work in this area, and and she was absolutely a blood clot, start to finish, fan. That was it's called that point the thrombogenic hypothesis, all to do with blood clotting. That's it's you know, called the thrombo. Genesis? Well, it's you can call it what you like, but it, it, I, I, I've tended to use the word thrombogenic. Thrombo being blood clot, genesis obviously being start or or the creation. So essentially, thrombogenesis is mm -hmm. the hypothesis. It was proposed in 1852. It's been proposed by various people actually over the years. There was another researcher in called Dugid just after the Second World War who who said it's all blood clots. Um, and your professor, that was that was her, she was also a... She wasn't a professor, she was a researcher. She was a, an unusual thing, a doctor, female doctor at that time. Wow. Um, she, she was doing research, her name was Elspeth Smith. Uh, when I first started reading papers by E. Smith, I thought it was a bloke, I didn't realize it was the same person. There you uh, go, uh, hands up. <laughs> How can a woman be doing research? <laughs> and uh, so, I just realized well, she she'd done it. She, I mean, weirdly, although she had said, "I, you know, I can show you evidence of blood clots, even in what appear to be normal artery walls. I, I can demonstrate, you know, all all the steps of it." But it never got paid attention. There was another researcher from the U.S. called Ronald Ross who had the uh, response to injury hypothesis, which was actually the same hypothesis, but which was that the first thing that happens is the artery wall, the lining of the artery wall is in some way damaged by something. This stimulates the formation of a clot. But he never really took it further than that, which is slightly weird. Um, and, and then the clot stops growing and then it's covered over. Was he very over. old perhaps or did he have a- well, I think at his time and both when he and Elspeth Smith were doing this um, work that, that statins were just starting to come in. So maybe, <laughs> and the cholesterol hypothesis was just this behemoth, right? Yeah. There's another. There's another chap that I communicate with called Kilmer McCulley, who was a professor in Harvard, and he was working on um, homocysteine. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I test. And he he found that children with very high homocysteine levels were more likely to get heart disease. Um, and he was doing this work and showing that homocysteine. An inflammation marker. Well, I don't like the word inflammation. Um, inflammation is always caused by something. By something else. Uh, by something else. Otherwise you, otherwise you believe in the concept of spontaneous inflammation, which I don't. Um, anyway, uh, homocysteine damages the lining of the artery walls and, um, and this triggers um, the process of heart disease. Now, he was actually booted out of Harvard at that time in the mid-70s um, for basically questioning the cholesterol hypothesis, even though he wasn't. But his work suggested the cholesterol hypothesis was probably not correct because right. we, yeah. we have a completely yeah. different process and and in fact he was hounded by harvard for years i'm not making you can look this stuff up there was an article about him in the new york times where when he went for job interviews after this people from harvard would phone the university he was going to and say do not give this man a job All right. right wow just to give you some idea of the of the um, viciousness that can occur so he um he, he, he's now, he came back in favor more recently. Uh, he's back, he's getting on a bit now. He's very Can you repeat his uh, name again, just to make sure? Kilmer McCulley. Kilmer McCulley, okay. Um, and he, he was essentially a good example of, if you were trying to uh, promote ideas that were not the cholesterol hypothesis, your funding was gone, your tenure was gone, and you were gone pretty soon after that. So it's not been easy to pursue other ideas. I mean, I, I'm not in the I'm not in the in the in the research world, and I don't work in a research department. I'm not paid for doing my research. I don't care about not getting research grants because I just do my own research. I mean, I go and speak to people. I've been recently chatting to a man who's the uh, ex, just currently ex president of the British um, British Interventional Cardiovascular Society. So he's say so he's not he's he's mainstream. He 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 knows that the cholesterol hypothesis. I shall not give you his name. He knows that the cholesterol hypothesis is wrong because he's watched 
clots forming on artery walls. He's seen people who've had chest pain. He's gone and looked at them. He's found there's a clot there. He's gone to get it out and he's gone. So he said, this, you know, this, we are seeing this process you're describing quite clearly in people. All right. So, you know, there's a lot of very quiet people out there who are noticing that it's, it's wrong. But anyway, so, so with this idea is, is, is that's, that's like going back to basis. So, so how can it work? How can it happen? I and mean, it's fantastically interesting research has been done where they got animals and they, they injected little blood clots into their veins. And, and the blood clots ended up in their lungs because it goes straight through the heart into their lungs. And they developed atherosclerotic plaques throughout their blood vessels in their lungs. All right. This is going back to the 1950s. And then what they did is said, well, well, actually, this is a quick fact on that. Mostly you don't get plaques in lungs. It's very unusual to get atherosclerotic plaques in your lungs. And one of the reasons for this is that blood pressure in your lung is very low. It's about 20 over 8 rather than 120 over 70. So without the biomechanical stress on the blood vessels, very little happens. Anyway, in the 1950s, you, you couldn't do heart lung transplants, uh, bypasses. So children who had congenital heart problems basically just, well, they died. But a number of them had conditions that meant that they fired blood clots off their heart and into their lungs, called pulmonary artery stenosis, sinus and Menger syndrome, etc. Anyway. So they couldn't operate on them, so um, they could now, so you're never going to see this ever again. And these clots broke off from their heart, went to the lungs, and they could see them transforming. They could see the process of transformation from blood clot arriving in the lungs to an atherosclerotic plaque forming. Straight through all those steps. Okay, it's not the same plaque, if you like. Uh, it's not the same blood clot each, each time, but they could see the stages of progression. And, um, and, and more recently, they did a study in adults who had similar problems, but they then had hung heart lung transplants and blah, blah, blah. And then they, they looked at their lungs and they found exactly the same process. They could see that, that basically the, the, the plaque started as a clot, transformed into what you would call a plaque, the same contents, essentially. And so you then had a blood you had the whole process all the way through. So this is what uh, Elspeth Smith had said. This is what Ronald Ross had said. This is what Dugan had said. Uh, this is what people had, had noticed. So, so you you think, well, it makes sense. This process, you can you can explain it all steps if you like. Just as a for instance, so why does smoking cause you to get heart disease? When it doesn't raise your blood pressure. It doesn't raise your cholesterol level. It, it doesn't do any of the things, the other things, if you like. So how, where's the process? Where's the, where's the, where's the mechanism of action from cigarette smoking to causing heart disease or, or, or plaques to form in your arteries? Now the current ideas, in my view, they can't explain that at all. Can they? There's no explanation. There's nothing to do with fat or cholesterol or anything. And the answer is, that when you smoke, a certain amount of the smoke gets into your bloodstream called nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles are quite toxic to the lining of the arteries. In fact, if you smoke, you get a volunteer to smoke one cigarette once, you can measure the actual dead endothelial cell, which is the endothelium is the lining of the blood vessels. You can measure these dead cells, they're called microparticles from the dead cells, in the bloodstream. So one cigarette once actually is quite toxic to the to the to the to the walls of the blood vessels. And and after that has happened, obviously, then a little blood clot forms. Mostly it's got rid of, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you keep smoking, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, just use as another example the disease with the highest risk of dying of, um, of cardiovascular disease that, that causes the underlying disease causing them the greatest risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. I could ask you to guess, but you'll never guess it in a bazillion years, is the sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia. Wow. And in one, one paper, it increased the risk of dying of a heart attack or stroke by 50,000%. Wow. Now that's proper. And then you say, well, how the hell does sickle cell disease cause 
strokes and heart attacks and atherosclerosis, uh, atherosclerotic plaques to, to develop. And the answer is quite simple. Have you ever seen a sickle cell? It looks like that. And it's instead of being like that, it's like that. It's got sharp pointy ends. Not all of the cells are like that. It's basically, it's got sharp pointy ends. So it causes damage within the, within the endo, endothelial lining, perhaps? Yes, exactly what it does. And that's, papers have been written saying that is, that is exactly what happens. In fact, I was looking at a paper, it was an eight-year-old boy who'd um, got gangrene in his left foot. He had sickle cell disease. His brother had died age four of a heart attack. Um, and they found that every single artery in his body, sorry, he was 12 years old, every single artery in his body was heavily calcified with atherosclerosis, aged 12, with no other risk factors for heart disease. He eventually had to amputate his leg. All right. Now, if you take one of the other things that happens with sickle cell disease is that your spleen becomes enlarged because your red blood cells go to your spleen to die. And if you've got sickle cells, they'll all die much more rapidly. So you end up with a big spleen. Quite often they can rupture. Like a traffic jam in your, in your spleen, is that? Spleen. Well, you get traffic jams in your brain, which is why you get strokes as well, because the blood cells have a tendency to do this. Anyway, if you take the spleens out, which quite often happens, it's apparently it's a way of killing people in Africa as you hit them there and rupture their spleens if they've got sickle cell disease. And um, yeah, these, I, I keep reading weird, weird things. Anyway, the, um, so you take the spleens out and then you have a look at their arteries. And when you look at their arteries in the spleens, they're all full of atherosclerosis. You know, it's like, you've got the answer here right in front of you. It's right in front of you, okay? You damage the artery walls, blood clots form. If you keep forming blood clots at the same point, you end up with a plaque. Eventually the plaque ruptures, the plaque rupture causes a big heart blockage and causes a stroke or a heart attack or blockage everywhere else. There you have it. It is no more complicated than that. Um, and every single factor that you can find, that like people say, well, how can diabetes cause an increased risk of heart disease? Because, well, it doesn't raise your cholesterol level, it doesn't raise your, it raises your blood pressure a bit, but so what's actually going on with diabetes? Why does this increase your risks to such a great degree? Well, the answer is that your cells, your endothelial cells, are also covered by, you know, if you try and pick up a fish, it's slippery. Scaly, yeah, slippery. Slippery, it's not the scales, it's what sits on top of the scales. Okay. It's a substance called glycocalyx, which is a glycogen protein matrix, which is a bit like a little, if you look at it under a super microscope, it's like a lawn that sits on, on your cells, right? But it, within that, it carries slippery stuff. So with a fish, you try and pick it up, it slips through your fingers. Well, all your blood vessels are covered with that as well. This allows the blood cells to go through and everything to pass through. And, and within this little forest is, contains, you know, 50 chemicals, many of which are strongly anticoagulant. In other words, they stop blood clots forming. That's their job. So it contains nitric oxide. And it, if you look it up, sure. most people have never heard of this substance. Right? They don't even know it exists. It, it's the lining, it's the protective lining of your blood vessels, okay? And, and, and when it thins, there is, it, it's basically like you're losing your protection for your endothelial cells. Okay. And so you're much more likely to get damage. And you can see that if you actually, you can measure the glycocalyx, it can be done. And if, you, if people have a high blood sugar level, you can actually see it thinning. And then when the glucose level falls down again, it, it actually recovers. So it's the high glucose level damages that protection. High glucose level damages the glycocalyx lining all of your blood vessels. And of further interest is the glycocalyx lines your very, very small blood vessels as well, like your, your capillaries, your arterioles, the really tiny ones. And when so you damage your really tiny blood vessels, hands, feet, eyes. You know where this is going. Yeah, yeah. Okay, your kidneys, go. your eyes, your nerve cells. And this is why diabetes causes this, what they call microvascular disease. Yes as well as the macrovascular disease, because it specifically destroys the glycocalyx. And microvascular disease obviously increases what they call the peripheral resistance, because obviously your blood has to reach your microvessels, get through it, get out the other side, and get back to your heart. Now, if you've got less or damaged small blood vessels, essentially what you end up with is, is, is reduced blood supply to, say, your fingers, and your, your, the, the, the nerves in your fingers. And, and that's why you get the, the, the neuropathy. Right. That's, why you, that's why you get the kidney disease and, and all these things are, are going on at the same time. It's also why you end up with a cut that doesn't heal because 
the blood vessels to the to that end stage tissue. There have been just far fewer of them. So you end up with gangrene and you end up with amputations. Amputation, yeah. yeah. Number one cause of non-accident amputations in the States, at least. That's why, that's why all this happens. So, so people say, well, how does diabetes cause it? Now, now if you've never heard of the glycopenics, you won't understand it. And, and I'll guarantee if you speak to 100 doctors and say, what's the glycopenics, none of them will give you an answer. I, I can't wait to go to the park today and talk to my doctor friends. I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, not. Well, maybe one of them will I do. If they work in, because they have actually started in some ICU units measuring the glycocalyx in patients who are seriously ill, and the measurement of the glycocalyx is a very accurate indicator of the overall health. Um, and if your glycocalyx stands right down, basically you're you ain't going to survive. Um, and that happens because in 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 sepsis, all right. Um, the, if you get nasty things in your, this, is, this, this wraps around to COVID, by the way. If, if, you, if you got sepsis, it's because you've got bacteria in your bloodstream. Right. And the exotoxins, what well, bacteria do is they produce toxins. They leak toxins out. That's their, that's, their, that's their kind of waste product. The exotoxins specifically attack, or the first site of action is, 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 is blood vessels and the blood vessel walls. So they strip the glycocalyx down and damage the endothelial cells. And that's why people with sepsis tend to die of widespread blood clotting because the blood clots form in all their blood vessels and as they get smaller in this case, not necessarily the large ones. So you get what they call disseminated intravascular coagulation and then, then the organs fail. Then you know when people have had sepsis, sometimes that their noses have fallen off in bits and because the blood supply has been so damaged to the peripheral parts of the body. That's why that happens. It's because the exotoxins destroy the endothelial cells and therefore knacker the circulation especially in the small blood vessels to start with and, and that causes death all right and so if you want to protect against death in these cases well obviously you've got to get rid of the bacteria um but one of the other things that you want to do is to try and maintain the um the the the, the, the protective systems within the endothelial cells and, and what endothelial cells really need is vitamin c at this point because when you're in acute sepsis you become, um, your body strips out the vitamin C, so you become effectively, um, 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 you've got scurvy, right, short term. And that causes further damage to the blood vessels because once you've done that, they all start cracking open. So high dose vitamin C can be beneficial and, and thiamine, and, and, and also it's been known for a long time that steroids do this because they dampen down the immune response effect. And that's why we're seeing these deaths with COVID, because COVID does exactly the same thing to blood vessels because it attacks blood vessels first because they've got the angiotensin II receptors in them. So they go into the endothelial cells, they start wiping out the endothelial cells, the endothelial cells die, the blood clots start, then you die. That's the, the primary cause of death in COVID is, um, is that you, you get blood clotting forming due to endothelial cell damage acutely in these situations. But you never thought you'd be talking about this? Oh my gosh. It's amazing. It's amazing. Dr. Kendricks, I, I think we're going to have to do about 10 more interviews because <laughs> you're such a, you are a wealth of so much knowledge. And um, I, I'm realizing the time has, we've been, we've been talking for. Yeah, no, no, sorry. I'm aware. I mean, when I get going, um, as you can imagine, I can bore anyone to death, but um, uh, I well, just. Well, this, is, this is fascinating stuff, but uh, I would, if it's okay with you, I, I think well, this might be a good point to, to sort of wrap it up and then come back and do some more and do another one, perhaps talking about COVID and what people can do. And, um, and I know we could go into more. We, we talked briefly about your, your two books, your three books actually. And just to recap, you've got the statin nation, you've got doctoring data, you've got the cholesterol con and in your new book, which will be coming out. When is your new book going to be coming out? Um, don't know for sure. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still working out a title. I, I, I've got one title in my head, which is what the LDL. <laughs> okay. What causes heart disease? But I, I, my other books have, you know, I've tried to lie a bit on humor. This one's a bit less jokey because it's like, it's like pretty, you know, if you, if you're interested in such stuff, but uh, in an attempt to, you know, what, what I'm really talking about here is the, is the real deal. You know, my other books have been kind of been on what not to do and what not listen to do. This one's okay. more, you know, this is actually, I'm going to tell you now what causes cardiovascular disease and what you can do 
all the things you can do to prevent it and um and uh, hopefully um um yeah, it's a bit more difficult to be funny about that somehow <laughs> so oh, like, I, I, I think humor is important but it's uh you gotta, gotta keep it under control well, sometimes i think you're gonna have i think you're gonna see a my instinct is you're going to see a much bigger market because um you know everyone wants to know what to do you know that's uh in fact we could do another interview just about that because we've analyzed so much so many things in this interview and uh, we could do another you know another short interview about you know your your suggestions about what to do and then perhaps another interview about you know talking about the whole covid can of worms because there's so much going on there but, uh, that, that, that one will be a smaller audience. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Once, no, once, the fact, once the fact checkers get on it and ban it. Yeah. Well, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's just, yeah, it would be how long will it, will it be up on, uh, on the major channels? Because uh, I, the other day, a, someone I know actually put a video, put a, uh, a very factual but controversial video up, and it was uh, taken down within five hours by YouTube. And by, and by Facebook in six hours. So um, I know. I know. that's that's where we're in right now. It's like the, the uh, that's the environment we're in, unfortunately. So, but anyway, I do want to be respectful of your time too. And uh, uh, I'm just looking at it. Thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I think uh, uh, the final point on that would be Jack Nicholson, isn't it? The truth. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's a lot. You know, that's something you might that could be a subtitle right there for your new book. You know, if you can, if you can handle the truth, yeah. is, you know, if you can handle the truth about heart disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. So I certainly will be uh, on the front lines, you know, because I've got quite the family history on, uh, on both sides with that. And, uh, and I, I became a father at 50. So my son is uh, four and a half. I just turned 55. And my goal is to be happy, healthy, and functional at his when he turns fifty. So I'll be a hundred. That's my goal. We'll see. Oh, well, well, that's good because my book says that we're all designed to live to a hundred. I have no wow. idea if this is true or not. But um, uh, and and it's only you know we would all get there if we didn't do things that were were you know knocking chunks off our life expectancy along the way. So I've I've tried to present it in that way. So that's interesting. As I've said, I, after a hundred, I'm not that bothered. But, um, you know <laughs> yeah that's that's true well well anyway well doctor once again i want to give you a big thank you um sincere appreciation for all your for all your uh, your time and for all you're doing and um i think what we'll, we can wrap it up now if the, and if for folks that want to look look for you your your books are on amazon um, i believe is that right yeah i've got a, so well i've got a website uh, a, a blog site on wordpress dr malcolm kendrick you just look it for there Okay, um, and, um, and, and, and slightly, slightly prefer people can buy at least one of the books, the doctoring data off that, because in that way the publisher gets more money. Amazon, oh, Amazon takes sixty five percent of the sales price. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of, they're, they're not, they're not doing anybody, any authors, any favor, favors, are they? No. Nope. Well, I will definitely, we'll put your website in the show notes and on our social media when we get this out there and we may break this up into two parts um, to, to uh, I'll, um, I've got someone who's going to, who actually handles that because I don't, I don't know my, uh, my way around the video editing at all. So <laughs> know your strengths, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Once again, hats off. Thank you so much. And, um, and we will be, be in contact when we get this ready to, uh, to, to put online. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Have a good luck with your book. Good. Take care. Take care. And come to Spain. Come get some sun. Get your vitamin D levels up naturally whenever you – if you ever come, whenever you come this way, do let me know. I'd like to uh, invite you to, to uh, uh, lunch or dinner or something. I've got a ski chalet in France. Um, <laughs> that's where I'm trying to head. I hear you. I hear you. Well, the summer, um, of course, you could go over there and do some hiking, I guess. Yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm increasingly despondent that we'll ever get anywhere. But, uh, oh, well, oh, well. Where are you in Madrid, yeah? Yeah, in, in Madrid, we're, we're down south now. I've got a place in Madrid, but my, my um, I'm going to go ahead and just stop, turn off the recording because we've got enough of that. Um, so... Yeah, my my Spanish, my wife is Spanish, and her her family's down south, and so uh, we came down to uh, and bought a second smaller house 
um, in the Seville area. And all right, yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's beautiful down that area, I must say. It is, yeah, yeah, beautiful, brilliant weather. You know, sunny, three hundred days a year, and uh, I get a Cervantes for 50, 50 cents. <laughs> Yeah, it's up, it's it's up to uh it went up with when the euro came in there was a 50% inflation but it's still, you know, small beer is like is you know a euro or a euro and a half, you know, something like that. So No, no. Uh, yeah, it'll be, well, I'll bear, I definitely bear it in mind absolutely. Uh, it'd be lovely to, uh, to Seville. I've never been to Seville. Oh, um, you've just now, my friends. You know, I've been to uh been up near got some friends who go to place and um Place called Armea de Mar, which is just north of the Ebro um, Ebro uh, Peninsula, yeah, south of Barcelona. So right, the, right. Yeah, uh, Seville is very is it's quite different because you had the uh, you know you had the Moors the Moorish influence. The Moors were here for um, almost almost six, for over six centuries, and yeah. so you've got that blend with you know the you oh, know, yeah. European architecture. Into, into Granada and Malaga. And, okay, well you know what I'm talking about then. Yeah, it's so yeah, it's a beautiful place. Anyway, I better love you and leave you. And uh, cheers. Yeah, thanks so much. We'll be in touch. Take care. Okay. Bye bye now.